Okay, for this video, I'm going to talk about the multilayer linear perceptron, and I'm going to use the iris data. So I have the Wick Explorer open. I'm going to find my iris data wherever it happens to live. I'm going to use the full data set, not the smaller two-dimensional one. And so I have the data here. And so remember the way we've been using the iris data, the iris data, we've been classifying it. So I'm going to use uh, first just the J48 decision tree as kind of a reminder of what to expect with this data. And I'm going to try to find the accuracy. And so we get 96% correctly classified. Um, so decision trees work well. We know that. The iris data set's pretty simple. 96% accuracy is definitely something to be happy about. But what we've seen in class is that the decision tree boundary with the decision tree is complicated. And when we look at the actual data, the the iris data in a scatter plot sense. And so if I want to look at um, really any of them, but if I change the the features here, then we know that what's going on is there's there's different um, two different clusters in this data, and that we know that well, the separation between these two is well defined, and the decision tree boundary, which will be perpendicular to one or another axis is going to be reasonable. But in this case, this is the decision boundary we want, but then the one we get with the decision tree is not quite that good. and It ends up being stair-step jagged. And that jaggedness means complexity. So this is something we talked about in class. That's just a little quick review of that. But what we want really is that nice straight line decision boundary. And we don't get that with decision trees. So a way we can get that, though, is that we can instead use the multilayer linear perceptron. And what it does is it finds a linear decision boundary. Linear just means a straight line or a hyperplane when we have more features. But it's one that it can adjust parameters. It can adjust numbers until it finds one that can be in a diagonal direction like that. It doesn't have to be perpendicular to one of the axes of our feature. And so if we want to look for that, we can find it up here in the classifiers folder functions, the multilayer perceptron, and we can accept the defaults if we just want to run it and see what we get. And so we can look at everything, and here we get 97% accuracy. So getting 1.3% more accurate in this case isn't really significant in any measurable sense other than it just being a number that looks bigger but what it what it tells us is that this can be just as successful as decision trees and because of the way the data looks to us it's actually a more natural way to think about the decision boundary because we see the cluster we see that the two classes are separated by a straight line that we want to draw at a funny angle and not perpendicular to horizontal or vertical and so this is, in some sense, a natural way to mine the data. So if you need to use the multilayer perceptron for your project, you can see that there's a lot of parameters here. And um, it's beyond the scope of the course to talk about all of these things. But um, suffice to say that, so that some of these, when you look at the reference for your project paper, and they talk about a multilayer linear perceptron, you can see what parameters they're using and then you can do a parameter study. You can vary the learning rate. You can vary this thing called the momentum, and then you can see how that affects your accuracy. That would be a good project to look at. In terms of the model for a multilayer linear perceptron, the model would be the parameters that describe that decision boundary that it generates. And so if we, if we scroll back, we see these things here where it's saying this is the sigmoid node. And so these, these are weights for the different features. And it, it, I digress because it's going to get a little bit too mathematical. But the, this is the model. So if you're using the multilayer linear perceptron for your project, a good idea would be to do a little bit of uh, independent study about what these numbers actually mean. And then you can report these numbers in a table. And that would be your model for the data miner. 